Are you where you need to be as a Christian today? With everything that God has done and as much as he's provided, are you where you need to be today, where you should be today as a Christian? The three words we're going to use tonight are the words patience, repentance, and inspection. And it's all because of that question I just asked is that this parable that Jesus tells is one where you see God's patience and understanding, his long-suffering nature. You also see that there's a, an opportunity given for repentance, repeated opportunities that are given for repentance, and that there's also going to be a coming day of inspection. So again, I want you to reflect on that question. Are you today where you should be today as a Christian? Many passages that we look at, such as Hebrews chapter 5, talks about that though by this time you ought to be teachers, someone needs to teach you again those first principles. You come to need milk and not solid food. And it points out that it's because of a lack of reason of use. You haven't put those things into practice that they were in that situation. And it is a really convicting passage when you think about it. When you sit and, and reflect, when I sit and reflect and think about what that passage is saying, it's very hard to say I'm exactly where I should be today as a Christian, especially consider everything that God has done for me. It, it's also difficult whenever you start thinking about that question because you, you might be prone to compare yourself with others. Well, this other person's been a Christian as long as I have. Look how much further along they are than I am. One thing we need to understand, God does not put us in competition with one another. That's something that we do ourselves. That's an unwise thing, Paul says, to compare ourselves with ourselves and among ourselves. That God is going to look at you. God's going to judge you by the things in which God has given you and the opportunities and talents that he has blessed you with. He's not going to judge you by me. He's not going to judge you by someone else. So again, it's asking you the question, are you where you need to be? Are you where you should be as a Christian today? If that's not the case, if you can't honestly say yes to that question, don't let it be from a, 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 a humility way of kind of pridefully answering the question. Well, of course not. I'm not. No, none of us are. But, but really try to be honest about that. Has God cultivated the ground around you in such a manner that you should be? Have you taken advantage of the opportunities that God has given to you? We know we all miss, miss those. There are seasons just like it is with a fig tree that we're going to look at. Just like with a fig tree, there's going to be years where there's going to be more rain than others. The sun's going to be especially hot that year in comparison to others and things such as that. But all in all, God has blessed us. So am I where I need to be, where I should be today? This parable is one that's so very important because it does speak to the idea that God is one who is looking for us to grow. And so I want us to think about this account that is given. And just to set up some of the background, in, in John chapter, or Luke rather, Luke chapter 12, it, here's Luke's accounting of some of the things that we will read about even in the Sermon on the Mount. But it seems that in Luke chapter 12, there's, a, there's kind of a strange situation that's going on. You, you have Jesus who's talking to a multitude of people, but even in the multitude of that people, he takes time to speak specifically to his disciples. But even as he's speaking specifically to his disciples, some from the crowd then begin to answer back, and so Jesus addresses them. Luke chapter 12, starting at verse 1, it says that an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled on one another. Then Jesus began to say to his disciples, first of all, and so Jesus starts talking about beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. In verse 4, he says, My friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. Afterward, they have no more that they can do. Uh, verse 8, he says, Whoever confesses me before men. Some of these things you see in Matthew chapter 10 and some other places. And it's right in the middle of that that we have this parable in verse 13 of chapter 12 of one in the crowd who answers him. So it has Jesus talking specifically to his disciples, but it seems that he's talking in the midst of this huge multitude of people that are around him, and, Jesus, and they hear what it is that Jesus is talking to his disciples about. And then in the midst of that, when Jesus is not talking about anything in regard to riches and money, somebody decides, teacher, tell my brother to divide inheritance with me. And so Jesus takes a sidebar, as it were, and begins to answer that question from the crowd. Who made me? And, and arbiter between you and your brother. And so he teaches a lesson about covetousness. And so after he teaches that lesson about covetousness, then he returns in verse 22, then it says to his disciples, 
Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. And it seems that Jesus has taken that lesson that one from the crowd has brought up to him to then teach a lesson to his disciples about this idea of covetousness and not worrying about things. And so when you go down through the rest of, of chapter 12, you see that he again is addressing his disciples about some things that are very important. In verse 41, Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all the people? Which makes Peter's question quite understandable. Okay, there's, a, there's all these people around. You've been talking to us, you've been talking to them, you've been talking to us, you've been talking to them. But this specific parable that you're taking, are you talking to, is this for us? Or it's for everybody. And so just as it is today when you have these many conversations going on, it's easy even for the Son of God to be misunderstood. Wait, wait, wait. Who are you talking to right now? And that's when you get into chapter 13. And when chapter 13 starts, you have a very similar thing that happened in chapter 12. That Jesus is preaching and teaching. And then you have people who come to Jesus with this account. The news of the day. That these people are offering these sacrifices and Pilate comes in and mixes their blood with the sacrifices that they're offering. And they ask Jesus, did you hear about that thing? And Jesus says, well, did you hear about the, the tower, Siloam, that fell on these 18 people and killed them? Did you hear about that? And Jesus takes that opportunity to teach a lesson that is very important when it comes to our particular uh, parable, the parable that he's talking about. What it most likely applies to, though, in John 1 and verse 11... It says that Jesus came to his own, and his own didn't, did not receive him. And what it says in John 1 about them not receiving Jesus, I believe is what Jesus is most immediately talking about in this parable. That God has visited his people several times and given them opportunity. But now it seems he's giving them one more year. I don't know if that one year is a literal one year because some do put this particular incident about the year and a half mark or so in the life of Jesus. Some say that he only had one more year left in his ministry. That's why he talks about the one year. I don't know if that's true or not. However, it is an interesting thing. But God had always said that this sort of thing was going to happen. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah 5, in verses 1 through 7, Isaiah 5 and verses 1 through 7. You have a very similar parable that's told in the Old Testament prophecy. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge please between me and my vineyard. What more could, I, uh, could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. And so here in, in Isaiah, you have a prophecy that I think Jesus is at least making a shadow reference to, it would seem, that what more could be done? And what was read for us tonight, you see that this owner of the vineyard had someone who was taking care of this vineyard in such a manner that the ground was prepared. All the things that would hinder its growth were taken out of the way. As he says in the Old Testament, what more could I have done for my vineyard that I didn't do? And I came forth over and over again expecting it to have these good grapes, these figs on it. But it didn't. Instead, it was barren. Or in the Old Testament, it says these wild grapes instead. Which again is kind of a convicting thing. So if I am bearing fruit, is it good grapes? Or is it wild grapes? Because God's cultivation can sometimes result in wild grapes. Sometimes we don't receive the Lord's help and instruction the way that we should. And because of that, we grow wild and not those good things that God is expecting out of us. Especially after all the work that he had put in. But God tells this parable in the Old Testament. There's also in Jeremiah chapter 8, another very similar account. Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 11 through 13. Jeremiah 8 and starting at verse 11. 
For they have healed the hurt of my people, uh, uh, the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. In the, in the time of their punishment, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. I will surely consume them, says the Lord. No grapes shall be on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree, and the leaf shall fade, and the things I have given them shall pass away from them. So sometimes the reason that there's no fruit that's born is because God says, I'm not going to let you bear fruit. Because by this time you should have been the type that could have. But instead, as the people of Israel were, they had a show. They had a semblance of being righteous. And they were healing the hurt of the people slightly. And they were saying to one another, peace, peace, when there was no peace. And too often the, the things that need to be faced and the things that be, need to be confronted are just ignored completely. Or said, well, let's just say peace, peace, when there is no peace. God says, I'm not at peace with you. And yet you're saying there's peace? There's no peace. And so because of that, you're not going to bear fruit. So when you ask that, yourself that question, am I where I should be today? Think about the question once again. And if the answer is no, why is that? Is it because God didn't cultivate the field around you? I think we all know the answer to that question is not that God didn't cultivate the field to make it ready. But was his cultivation one that brought forth in you good fruit or wild fruit? Or when you look at yourself, do you say, you know what? It just seems like I'm always pretending. That I make a good show of it, but there's nothing really of benefit that comes out of it. And maybe it's because there's other things in your life that need to be gotten rid of. And so when you look at this account that Jesus is talking about, he tells them and, and begins to correct some of the misconceptions that they have because when he talks to them in Luke chapter 13, they ask him about this, this uh, blood that was mingled with the sacrifice and Jesus talks about the tower that falls. But in both instances, Jesus says the same thing, identical statements. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. One of the misconceptions we have is that we sometimes think that we are not the same type of sinners as others. That we somehow think that the reason that we have whatever level of righteousness we have today is because we're not as bad as sinners as others. And that there's always someone that we can point to that's worse. And Jesus says, no. You're looking at it the wrong way. And there's a lot of passages that talk about it. Remember in Acts chapter 28, verses 1 through 6, that after they're stranded after uh, verse, uh, chapter 27 of the long uh, chapter that talks about the voyage of Rome that Paul's on the ship and then they're shipwrecked. And in Acts chapter 28 and verse 1, it says, Now when they had escaped, they then found out that the island was called Malta. And the natives showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging on his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. So think about, stop there for just a moment and think about this. Sometimes we think that bad things happen to people because they're sinners. And worse sinners than us. And that's what they thought. Surely this man is a murderer. He's a horrible sinner. Because why else would this viper come out and lash onto his hand in such a manner as that? That only happens to sinners. But notice what happens in verse 6. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him... They changed their mind and says that he was a God. How quickly people's mind changes and how quickly it is that we jump to conclusions about things. And neither one of these things were right. He's either a murderer, that's why he got bit, but no, he didn't die, so he's a God. We can't look at things that are going on in one another's lives and decide just simply by that whether or not we have favor or whether God looks unfavorably at our lives. And that's what Jesus clears up a misconception about. Don't think that you are better off 
than other sinners. Because after all, we are all sinners. And because of that, we are all in need of repentance. And so in the midst of this uh, deal, he talks about their misconceptions and addresses them. Just as it was with Job's friend in, in Job 4. Let's go to Job chapter 4. And notice verses 7 through 8. Job 4, verses 7 and 8. Remember now, whoever perished being innocent? Or where were the upright ever cut off? Even as, even as I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. And you notice that even in that statement that we can look at that and say, wait a minute, <laughs> there's a little bit of problem with that logic that he's using there. But he does point out, as I have seen, that's there. Job's friends were even trying to figure out what is going on with Job. What's the problem? What's the deal? We need to understand we can all be uh, fall victim and be praised of having misconceptions about things. And Jesus points that out to them. Even Jesus' own disciples in John 9, verses 1 through 7, you remember the account, this is the man who was born blind. And when they come by, Jesus' own disciples look to Jesus and they point out this blind man and they say, who was it who sinned? Was it this man? or his parents, that he was born blind. And Jesus has to point out, you're, you're, you're giving me two options, and both of them are wrong. And often that's how, that's how our misconceptions are. There's two options here, and both of them are wrong. And that's why we can't communicate. And that's why we're having difficulty. It's because we have the misconception. And we fail to look at it the way that God does. And so Jesus uses this encounter, this uh, mis uh, misconception that they have to then speak this parable. So I want us to go back to Luke chapter 13 and look at this parable one more time. Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 9 once again. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, Look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig, it, uh, dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, uh, but not after that, you can cut it down. And so Jesus tells them this parable, and then he just kind of leaves. He doesn't, as he does in some of the other parables, give a long explanation. He doesn't pull them aside to describe it and talk about what he's, what he's uh, symbolizing through the parable. But in Matthew, we see that the reason that Jesus spoke parables was for two reasons. To reveal and to conceal at the same time. That he's going to reveal it to those who have a heart to listen. Who take the symbolism and understand what he's talking about. But also to conceal. For those who don't want to see anyway, they're not going to see this either. And so Jesus tells this story, and then he walks away. But we understand the lesson that's there. Because Jesus has just said, no, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So this parable has something to do with the idea and the principle involved behind repentance. And so let's look at the application that is there. When you, when you see this particular parable, I think there's several lessons we can learn. One of them is that fruit is indeed expected. In Luke chapter 8, when we have the parable of the sower going out and sows his seed, that it is something very important that when he plants that seed, he is expecting growth. However, we know that when a farmer goes out and plants his seed, that there's a lot of things that can interfere with that. The ground can be too hard. There may be thorns and thistles that come up. The birds may come down. There's a lot of different problems that can interfere with the seed's growth. But the person sows the seed because he's expecting a crop that comes from it. And so Jesus says in John 15 that my Father is glorified when you bear much fruit. The way in which we know that we're supposed to glorify God is by bearing fruit and by producing. And it's right for the master to do so. It's interesting that in the Old Testament that you have many examples of these people who plant vineyards and God uses them over and over again in these stories even as we go into the New Testament. 2 Peter 3 and verse 18, it tells us what? We're supposed to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What we have to understand is this. You were saved for a reason. God saved you for a reason. 
that you bear fruit. Not that you look like a fruit tree, but that you bear fruit. Because why should you keep taking up the ground? And that's one part of that parable that really sticks out to me. You're taking up good ground. Nothing wrong with the ground. Except for this. It's being wasted. There's nothing wrong with the, the master coming back and looking for fruit and then going around and digging around the tree and fertilizing it. Except for this. It's being wasted. And so the trees that don't bear fruit, God says we need to get rid of them. That scares me when I ask myself that question. Am I where I need to be as a Christian? Is this where I should be right now? Or am I just wasting space? I don't like that idea. I don't like that at all. And it's scary to consider. In Titus 2 and verse 14, we were saved that we might be the kind of people who are peculiar, who are different, and who are zealous for good works. That's why we were set apart, and that's why we were saved. Also in this parable we see this, that the master is indeed patient, though. The, the whole letter of Peter deals with false doctrine. Second Peter deals with false doctrine. But in chapter 3, notice the kind of patience that Peter talks about throughout this entire chapter. Second Peter chapter 3, and starting at verse 1. Peter says, Beloved, now I write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up, notice this, I stir up your pure minds by way of a reminder. Brethren, even pure minds need to be reminded of some things, need to be reestablished in some things. And so Peter says, I'm writing to you a second time because I want to take your pure minds, not because they're polluted by something, your pure minds, and remind you, stir you up once again about these things that you've heard over and over again. The Lord's not slack concerning his promises like some count slackness. There's a lot of scoffers in the world that say, where is the promise of his coming? And since the beginning of time, all things continue as it is to this day. So where is the promise of his coming? You say he's coming, where is it at? The Lord's not slack concerning his promises like some people are. God's going to keep his promises. The world that was created by him is going to be destroyed by him, just like he said it would. The reason the world continues is this. The Lord's not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This three-year period that's pointed to in this parable is actually a lot longer probably than that three-year period that is mentioned. And even that one year later that he comes back is like, okay, I'm expecting something, and I'm not seeing it. So here's another question. If you're not where you should be as a Christian today, when are you going to start getting there? Because I know how easy it is to say, you know what? First of the year, I'm going to start reading my Bible every day. First of the year, I'm going to start inviting people over to my house, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do all these different things. First of the year. Oh, wow. I didn't realize January 1st came so quickly. Next month. Before you know it, 10, 15 years pass, and nothing's happened. How many years do we let slide by? So if you're not where you should be, when are you going to start getting there? When are you going to take that first step? God is patient because he is not willing that any should perish. We should be the kind of people who can confidently, like it says in verse 12, be looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. The heavens are going to be dissolved. They're going to be on fire. The elements will melt with a fervent heat. But we are to be the kind of people, verse 13, who look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We're to be looking forward to these things in verse 14. We're to be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. We're to consider that the long-suffering of the Lord is salvation, as he even points to Paul writing about. You, therefore, in verse 17, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. And as He concludes, amen. Romans chapter 2 says that we can take the cultivating of the Lord, this peace, this long-suffering nature of our God, and that cultivating that it talked about in the Old Testament, remember what that cultivation did? For some, it could have bore fruit. But the fruit that it bore in some places was wild fruit. The long-suffering of the Lord 
Do we look at, as Romans chapter 2 says, this long-suffering nature of the Lord, His steadfastness, do we look at that patience and use that against ourselves? Or are we the kind of people who use that the way that we should? That it leads us to repentance, that it leads us to be more like God? Or do we take it for granted? These crops that were there, these fig trees that were there, the rest of them were producing, but this one was not. We also need to understand this. The master will help us to produce fruit. He's not willing that you be left out there alone by yourself and not help you in producing the fruit. He's going to do whatever he can in order to help you do that thing. In Leviticus 19 and verse 23, it's interesting that in the parable, it talks about this three-year span that he's been coming and looking for fruit. Actually, it was probably double that amount of time of about six years because in Leviticus it says that when you plant a tree, those first three years is pretty much off limits. It's to be considered like an uncircumcised thing, an unclean thing, and so you're not supposed to go to it and inspect anything. So this tree was probably in the ground for six years, not just three. And now it's been given even more time on top of that. So God has gone well beyond the amount of time that's necessary for these trees to produce fruit, for Israel to be productive, and they've not been. And so in my life, I know that it's not just a little past time, it is way past time. That I've been putting this off too long. I have waited way too long. God has given me twice as much time as I've needed. By this time, I should be twice what I am today. And yet he still gives me another year. He still gives me another chance and another opportunity because of his long-suffering nature. 2 Peter chapter 1, and we looked at this in our study a few weeks ago, when we noticed that God is the one in verse 2 of 2 Peter chapter 1, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust, but also for this very reason, add, giving all diligence, add. And what, this is what we noticed about that, is that if we are adding to our faith, God is multiplying the blessings. Because all you're capable of, all I'm capable of, is adding to my faith. God is the one who can multiply. I'm the one who says, if I make it to heaven, it's just going to be by the, the skin of my teeth. It's going to be barely making it to heaven. God says, no, I'm going to supply an, an interest to this kingdom abundantly to you. It's a difference of perspective. We were like that tree that's planted in the garden. Well, how can I produce fruit? I mean, look at all these other trees that are producing fruit. God says, I'm here for you. I'm, I'm cultivating the ground. I'm fertilizing. I'm giving you time. I didn't make it an immediate thing. I've given you opportunity to grow. I want you to grow. If you will work with me a little bit, God says, I will make heaven abundantly available to you. I will do more than you can even imagine if you'll give me the chance I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. But that patience will one day come to an end. He will help us bear fruit, but there is a final inspection that is coming. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 18, that we didn't read just uh, uh, a moment ago, talks about how it is that God has set each member in the body just as he sees fit. Every one of us is needed. Every one of us is valuable. And every one of us provides something. Even though we may be only one tree, we are still needed. And we still have an impact. But that final inspection is indeed coming. In Matthew 12, another passage that can be kind of scary. Matthew 12 and verse 30. Jesus said, He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. God expected something to be on that tree. And God saw it this way. That if you are not bearing fruit, then you are against me it's not that you're sitting there by yourself and you have no impact but God says that if you're not with me you are actively against me there's no straddling the fence in Acts 26 and starting at verse 19 Paul in talking about his post life conversion Acts 26 19 and 20 Paul says, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declare first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent to God and do works befitting repentance. 
Do those things that are befitting the opportunity that you, that you were given. In Acts 17, verse 30, it says that the times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent because there is a day coming. There's a day that God has appointed in which he will judge the entire world by the one that he sent, that we're going to be judged by Jesus Christ. And that day is coming, and it's an appointed time. He tells, that, he tells the guy who's watching after his vineyard, cut it down. The guy says, look, give me one more year. Give us one more year. Let me dig around it. Let me fertilize it. Let me make it ready. I don't want to cut down the tree. I mean, it's been here all these years. I don't want to cut it down. It has so much potential. It has so much good that it can do. Okay. Let's give it another year. But when he comes back in that year, if there's no fruit on that tree, that's it. We don't know when that year is up. We don't know when that time is coming, but brethren, that time is coming. And so when I ask myself the question, am I where I'm supposed to be as a Christian? Am I where I should be as a Christian? If not, when am I going to start moving in that direction? And then realize this night may be your very last shot at it. It may be it. My dad, when he had a, a heart attack that nearly killed him, was Wednesday night after a, a Wednesday night Bible study. And he went home, not thinking that that could be his very last service ever attending. And it almost was. A dear brother that we had in Alabama, he led the closing prayer. On the way out the door, he said the farewell that he always said, let's go halfway to, to Louisville, which is where his house was. I'll see you Wednesday. No, he didn't. That was it. That was his final night. Time for his inspection had come. Rather, we have a time that's appointed. And that time is coming, and it comes quickly. We need to be about the kind of people who are going to repent of those things that we need to repent of, to make our life right concerning those things that we need to, to make right. When you think about what repentance is, it's important to understand that repentance means that we reflect upon those things that we know ought to be different. And as we talked about this morning, maybe meditate on those things a little bit and come to a full understanding of them. That repentance is, is going to involve things like remorse, being sorry that I wasted time or that I misused that time for a lot of things or I was growing wild fruit instead of good fruit. That I need to be about rethinking some things and make a resolve to do some things differently. That repentance is not just simply saying that you're sorry. Repentance is also going to provide, do some, uh, require some things like restitution, which I know a lot in the world don't agree with. However, repentance, if at all possible, involves restitution. If you're driving a car out there in that parking lot tonight that does not belong to you because you stole it from somebody, guess what you need to do with that car? Give it back, right? And we use a simple illustration like that to say to somebody, if you have a woman that is not your wife, guess what you need to do with that woman? You need to give her back. We understand it with cars. We don't understand it with marriages. Why is that? When we're talking about repentance, understand, we're in the same boat as everyone else. Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. God is continually coming looking for fruit. Year after year, he's looking for that fruit. If he doesn't see that in my life, how much longer is he going to give me? I don't know. Tonight may be the very last night that we have that opportunity, that any of us have that opportunity. It may be yours, maybe mine. We don't know. But we do know there's a day coming. And we need to pray to God and work to make sure that we are ready when that day comes. So that's the question I'm going to leave with you tonight is, are you bearing fruit? I pray to God that you are. This, this parable that Jesus tells is a very sobering reminder of how important it is to, to stay focused on the things that we should be staying focused on, to not be distracted by other things, to take advantage of the opportunities that God gives us. I mean, we, we have so many opportunities available to us just as a congregation of God's people. We've got so many studies going on. We have so many people who are doing, thing, doing things with and, and for others. If you're not involved... Let's get involved because the ground is cultivated. The ground is rich. There's, there's plenty of fertilizer in it. There, there's no reason for any of us to not grow. 
We can, and we will with God's help. And so if you're subject to the invitation because you need to be baptized for the mission of your sins, or you need to change your life, or you need some help in getting back on track, let us know. We're here for you. As together we stand and sing, won't you please come if we can be of assistance.